You're all very welcome here this morning and it is my great pleasure to welcome Theo Dorgan to speak with me this morning about Seamus Heaney's final volume, Human Chain. Theo Dorgan, Corkman, poet, teacher, translator, editor, partaker and recounter of extended sea voyages and of the dreams they generate a broadcaster on and true enabler and defender of the arts. Bernard O'Donoghue rightly called Theo one of the great keepers of the grail of Irish poetry in this current era. His books of poetry include The Ordinary House of Love, Rosa Mundi, Sappho's Daughter, Days Like This, What This Earth Cost Us and Greek. And it is my tremendous pleasure to welcome him here this morning to speak to us of Seamus. Can I say it's, um, it's always a pleasure to be on a high stool in UCD, but um, <laughs> there's a slight difference to the usual high stool on which you find yourself, so I'm, yes, can't mention that. So um, Theo, I thought we might begin this morning uh, just to ask you to, to read one or two poems from Human Chain of your own choice. Okay. Well, the poems I thought um, we might try to fix in our minds this morning, um, the two that I thought would start us off are Had I Not Been Awake and the title poem, Human Chain. Had I not been awake, I would have missed it. A wind that rose and whirled until the roof pattered with quick leaves off the sycamore and got me up, the whole of me a patter, alive and ticking like an electric fence. Had I not been awake, I would have missed it. It came and went so unexpectedly and almost, it seemed, dangerously, returning like an animal to the house. A courier blast that there and then lapsed ordinary, but not ever after and not now. And the other poem, I think, then, in a way, these are the two keys to the volume, these two poems, The Human Chain for Terence Brown. Seeing the bags of meal passed hand to hand in close up by the aid workers and soldiers firing over the mob, I was braced again with a grip on two sack corners, two packed wads of grain I'd worked to lugs to give me purchase ready for the heave. The eye to eye, one, two, one, two, upswing onto the trailer, then the stoop and drag and drain of the next lift. Nothing surpassed that quick unburdening, back breaks, truest payback, a letting go which will not come again, or it will once and for all. And I think those two poems matter because they speak to the, the double pulse of what sustained a most extraordinary life in poetry, which is the always ready openness to inspiration when it would come, the electric fence that's always on, ticking along at a low voltage, but delivering a charge when touched. So he's always on, he's always ready. Paul Amihan says, that, you know, all poems come from the muse but you can't be just wandering around the world with her having to find you. It helps if you sit at your desk every day so she knows where to find you if she has a poem for you. And in the second poem, the, you know, the, uh, the title poem here, that's what Seamus is talking about, ready for the work. Because poetry is a conversation between inspiration and work. He says elsewhere in the book, he says that steadiness mm -hmm. is the great virtue and he was the steadiest man I ever met. He was steady as a rock, like Anchises, the feet sunk deep in the earth. But that's poetry. Language guards itself. Language comes down to us in a stream from the past, and we don't know what future it goes out into. And we're born into it. Nul in the lovely uh, lines, Curus Maran extraver sruth I set my word, my poem afloat on the stream of language. And some say the poet's business is to keep the stream of language clear. But you make little boats, little crafts, by craft, and you must be open to the inspiration, but you must be prepared with the 10,000 hours that go into learning the craft. So the steadiness of the work, the one, two, and you put it up. And it speaks of a sense of the cooperative. 
you know, these big sacks of meal, these big sacks of grain, it's work done in common in the harvest with others. Mm. You know, whether the poets who have come before or the poets who are mm. standing by his shoulder at the time. Mm. It was one of Seamus' great virtues that when he said we're all in this together, he simply meant it. It wasn't being polite, it wasn't, well, I know I'm the greatest, <laughs> but I'll let her. He meant it. It is a common cause, a common endeavor. And not just his common, en his common endeavor in language, his commitment to language is common endeavor, was shared with his neighbors and his friends and his ancestors. He felt he was gifted and blessed to be able to shape the poems, but he knew that poetry is everywhere, in potentia. It's like Michael Hartlett used to say, I have words to hand, it's poems I cannot find. Thank you, Theo. Theo, can I ask you, how did you first get to know Seamus Heaney's work? Well, it was really very easy because when I was an undergraduate, when I was in first year in UCC, um, there was very little po contemporary poetry being published. And it was a given, it was accepted as a given, um, that Faber was the place to go to. So naturally, when you wanted to begin to, ex to uh, educate yourself in contemporary poetry, you returned to Faber. And Seamus was the rising star. But he was also, funnily enough, he was being whispered about by people who don't read poetry. The name was known. They say that Cú Chulainn was given the choice of um, a, long and in a long life and to live, uh, live his life until he would die of old age and inanition, or a short life with his name, a male nanina, in the mouths of the people. And it seemed, like when I was about 17 or 18, people knew there was this poet, Seamus Heaney, and people already had begun to nod respectfully at the name, who hadn't read a word he'd written. And when I was in second year in UCC, um, John Montague came to teach there. And Montague and Heaney were old friends. And, and he began to loan us the books. And of course, then they were in the city library and so on. I was kind of intrigued by him because I thought he was terribly old fashioned. Um, because at 17 or 18, um, you don't understand the value, and often the radical value, of your own home ground, the radical value of what is familiar. So we were obsessed. I mean, you have to remember, we were the first rock and roll generation. Bob Dylan was our spokesman. You know, and Leonard Cohen was who, if we were lucky, we went to bed with people to. Do you know? <laughs> Leonard is a great man to ease you through those first awkward undressings. You know the ones I mean? <laughs> you know, a bit of Leonard in the background to, to take all the... the um, yeah, well, not all, but some of the anxiety out of that. And it was always lovely to wake up to Leonard as well, you know, peace to his soul. Um, but, you know, we were the electric generation. You, you, my day, I never had long hair, by the way. I had big hair like Jimi Hendrix. You could never get it to grow down. <laughs> so you can picture me at 18 with, you know, a, a Rory Gallagher album or a Dylan album on the arm and a denim jacket and a sleeping bag. You could go anywhere in the world and get a bed because there were heads just like you, man, <laughs> everywhere in the world. <laughs> So we, we were very conscious of belonging to this international generation. So we were reading Ivan Illich and Paulo Freire. We were reading Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and all of them, which all of you are now, but they're getting it second or third time round. I mean, we could reasonably expect to run into Jack Kerouac characters hitching across America. And unfortunately, sometimes did. And um, some great spaces out there. And acid was new and dope was new. You know. and so to come back to the farmlands of Balahi, you know, was not easy. But the way back, oddly enough, was through the war in the north. Because Seamus came out of those disputed territories. He came out of those places that were ripping themselves apart right up into the present moment in the news. So Balahi, nobody had heard of Balahi for 50 years, and then suddenly, mm -hmm. Derry, Cookstown, Five Mile Town, they're all right in your face in the up-to-date medium of television. Mm -hmm. So he came up as a shock then out of that. So after that, bit by bit, we began to negotiate our own ways, different ways back. Um, Tom McCarthy, my contemporary in Cork, and still my dearest friend, um, was probably the first, because he took himself back into Capoquin to understand that the lineaments of history live in the ordinary, everyday where we live. That we live in history. That life is not elsewhere. So I began to find my way back in Tahini mm. through the mid to late 70s that way. And it was, it was a powerful education. Mm. Um, Theo, that sense of you know, the, 
where it's happening now being what matters and the, the sources that you draw on, fr which are your first sources and the, power, the empowerment of that through, 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 through Heaney. Has your, in, your reading of him at various points of your life, has, has, the, has it had a, has an impact at, at certain stages or points? Has that shifted you know, as, as you have followed along with him through his career? Well, it's a very, very good question, and, and, and I can only give you a provisional answer because I think it's a process that's still going on. Um, and I'm, I'm conscious that I'm not actually going to live forever. This has begun to dawn on me recently. And um, so I'm thinking now of how Seamus dealt with ageing yeah. and how he dealt with the inevitability of death, which is what the human chain is all about. It's, um, mm. it's a settling of his accounts before he dies with the death he knew was not far off. So naturally, there's that. But I've come to a time where I was thinking, how did Seamus deal with the midlife, mm -hmm. with the sense um, where you ask yourself, what promises did I make that younger self? What promises did I make myself when I was your age? And have I kept them? Have I been true to my word? Or has life been otherwise? Mm -hmm. And how have I coped with that change? And it's curious that there is that register, book by book in Seamus, of dealing with the life in the moment. A lot of poets will jump generations in their preoccupations. They'll find themselves in their 50s writing um, extraordinary books about their childhood. Mm -hmm. John Montague, very late, into his late 60s, early 70s, wrote Time and Armagh, which, if you sort the chronology out properly, should have been his first collection. Right? But he had this sudden panic and went back to his childhood. Seamus's thos, what's the English, measuring of the world, kept pace with his steady, advance through the decades. Mm -hmm. And so that, it ex that part explains why he returns to the wound, the open wound that is the North, over and over again, like somebody in those Viconian spirals. He comes back again after 10 years and looks back mm -hmm. down, and he comes back and looks mm -hmm. down. He comes back to his mother mm -hmm. uh, in the kitchen. He comes back to the aunt with the meal scoop. He comes back to the coal man. He comes back to the, uh, the birth of a child in the cottage, or he comes back to a neighbor's wake. These things come back cycle by cycle, but each time he's moved on and up, and in a sense, in. Mm. So he, he revisits his own understandings, and he doesn't revise them, he recasts them. Mm. So he, he says there, as I say, that steadiness mm. is the great virtue. Mm. And so there, there is a steadiness of attention. But he's always, the, the breastbone is always opening to the shock of the new. You know, Cassandra keeps entering in. And so he's, he's a ruthless self-reviser, not in the way that Derek Mann is. Derek Mann is constantly revising the texts of the poems. Seamus is revising what he always, in retrospect, sees as a defective understanding. And he's hoping that each new iteration is an increase in understanding. So that the conversation between human chain, say, and his translation of book six of the Aeneid. This is the preparatory work to that. Yeah. But this is the ground, even though as yet unfinished, this is the ground out of which this yeah. book comes. And, and, and I, I think actually the, the Hall Lantern as well. Mm. You know? Mm. And what is it? In the Aeneid, Aeneas goes down into the wor under underworld in search of his father. Mm. And with Seamus, you could say, there is a perpetual return to a search for the father. Not in the Irish sense of feeling guiltily, have I let him down or have I fulfilled his promise, but a, a wish to understand what your responsibility is in the world. Because you know, most young boys and, uh, would, would, would identify with their, most young boys would identify with their father mm. as the model of how to live responsibly in the world. Mm. And most young girls, now this fluctuates and generates. I mean, it's by no means as simple as that. I'm speaking historically and not necessarily the present moment, where thankfully things have become much more complex. But the figure we look to as the embodiment of the responsible when we're young is, if we're lucky, the figure we keep coming back to check with. So he goes down into the underworld searching for his father as a way of interrogating the self and asking, how am I doing? Am I behaving well? Am I living well? And so I think that's a recurrent yeah. feature. The willingness, the courage to ask, am I living well? Is that a sense of the, the, the openness, perhaps, of that, totally. of that example of revisit, revisiting the self? Um, 
he becomes, in that sense, perhaps a father figure to us he after, does. after him. And he was in quite, in, in many near literal senses, mm. he was a father figure to two generations mm. of poets. He was the most extraordinarily generous man with his time. Um, I don't think I'm betraying any confidence when I say that um, towards the end of his life, when Seamus had a stroke, he was aware that he could retreat from the world and extend his span of years or keep giving at the risk of dying younger. And Mary says, well, look at him. You saw the choice he made. And he did. See, I, I want to say to you, because much of this is going to just go past you, because quite rightly, you're preoccupied with your own hormones and ambitions and fears for the exams. And some of you, and these are the ones I most deeply sympathize with, trying to stay awake at this ungodly hour of the morning. <laughs> I was never notorious for going to morning lectures myself. But it's a mistake to make heroes of writers or singers. It's a mistake to make heroes of them. But they are there in all their frailty as models to us of how we might live, or part models of how we might live. And I encourage you, when you read Seamus Heaney, to understand that you were reading the words of a man who faced life squarely and with great courage, but lived with an immense open-hearted generosity and fully conscious that it was that generous attitude to the world which permitted the world to be generous to him. You know, what you put out into the world is what comes back to you. And Seamus put the best of his attention and the best of his honor in his dance with language, and language rewarded him. So you may now discount everything else I say this morning if you would do me the kindness of simply remembering that to live with honor in the face of language, to respect yourselves when you write an essay. Say, does this reflect well on me? Is this the best I can do? Because this is me. You're not pretending to be somebody else. You are writing as yourself. And Seamus, like all the truly great poets, worked incessantly to write only as himself, to give honest witness, which is the poet's business. End of sermon. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it's mornings that have a peculiar effect on me. Actually, Theo, something of what you're saying now is, is making me think about the title of this volume, Human Chain. Yeah. Um, in fact, wh what you've been speaking about over the last few minutes over, over, overall. Why, why do you think Heaney used or chose he that He was a title? genius with titles, wasn't he? Like yeah. District and Circle. It came to him sitting on the tube, yeah. literally. But look at all the resonances. Yeah. Human chain, I think there, there's a double pulse. There nearly always is in, 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 in Heaney's titles. It's, of course, the unbroken chain of human contact. I mean, we are bundles of accidents that come from bundles of accidents that come from bundles of accidents, all the way back to the Rift Valley in East Africa when you check back the mitochondrial DNA. And sometimes I think that everything has already happened and we are instances of the future remembering itself. You know? And that's the way it is. But it has passed on from mother and father to child to child to child to child. The human experience is passed on, obviously, in a direct biological line, but also culturally. Francis Stewart had um, a notion of what he called the high consistory. He had elected a jury of the writers he most admired. And when he tried to write well, he tried to write something that would not embarrass him in front of those great writers. I mean, the one I would dread having my work judged by is Anna Akhmatova. You know, I would dread having my work judged by Anna Andreevna because she would, she, if she spotted a false note in a poem of mine, she wouldn't have much trouble. There are plenty of them. But that would really devastate me. I would be ashamed of it. Um, and so when you start asking yourself those kind of questions, you see your lineage. Mm -hmm. So Seamus is in a lineage. And he's in a lineage with Hardy. He's in a lineage with Dante. Mm -hmm. And how marvelous to be able, without any self-consciousness, to see yourself as a kind of conversation with Dante. Mm -hmm. but, but the Aeneid is in his lineage, Jane, in his ancestral chain. All writers elect their own forebears. You place yourself in a line coming down from someone. Doris Lessing means a great deal to me. Mm -hmm. And her good thoughts about one of my books meant an enormous amount to me at a very shaky time in my life. So we elect 
the people that, you know, it's like when we were kids picking teams in the schoolyard, you know, you and you, so it's Dante, Mandelstam, Ovid, you know, and Mandelstam was important to, to, to Seamus as well. So there's that chain. And then there's the human chain, just of relatives and ancestors and grandmothers and grannies and cousins and nephews and neighbors. Mm -hmm. There's a second sense, though, is that the human soul is fettered about and bound down with chains, the chains of this mortal existence. And that takes us back to the underworld, to the Avernus where no birds fly, mm -hmm. and the sense that the soul is weighed down by accident, by mortality, mm -hmm. by tragedy. Um, and that so, you know, we must carry our chains. You know, and in the sense, we're galley slaves. We're chained together as we row the dark boat of history across darkening waters. There's that sense, and there's the sense that we are prisoners, almost as if we're in shackles in Plato's cave and the world is passing outside and we must lift ourselves above that, that sense. So I think both those things are there. And then the other image that always comes to me is somebody is in trouble in the water and you form a chain to reach out to rescue them. Yeah. The, you know, that's a human chain, yeah. you know? Bring them home. Yes, to bring them home. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, All of those things, I think, yeah. are implied in the title. That point of lift-off that you speak about, that rising of the self above, above you know, out of the darkness, into, into, into something as another dimension. Mm. Did, did certain poems, um, when you first read this volume, Human Change, did they give you that kind of a sense of an, an electric shock, to borrow James's own terms here? Well, they did, but, you know, to be honest with you, the... Um, that shock was nothing like the shock of reading the poems after he'd died and seeing how much was prefigured right. in the poems. Yeah. I mean, I think we all felt when the book came out that this was Seamus's Ave Atque Vale. We thought this is the valediction, this is the farewell. And we were horrified because we didn't want him to go, but he knew he was going. He knew he was running out of road. Um, and so there was a poignancy in that, and which sets the hairs on the back yeah. of the neck standing. Yeah. And of course, that's doubled and redoubled now right. since he went. So it's very hard to get back through yeah. that second read yeah. to the first read. But there were poems in it that um, absolutely lifted me. A Kite for Avine, which was, will I read it? Please. Um, a Kite for Avine, and it's every now and then in, in Seamus, back through the books, um, he writes poems for his children, and in this case, his grandchildren. He wrote a hazel stick for Catherine Anne, for instance, which I might read as well, if you like, um, or a kite for Christopher and Michael. But Avian was his most recent granddaughter, um, and this is called A Kite for Avian. It's after L'Aquilone by Giovanni Pascoldi. Air from another time and place, Pale blue heavenly air is supporting a white wing beating high against the breeze, and yes, it is a kite. As when one afternoon, all of us there trooped out among the briar hedges and stripped thorn, I take my stand again, halt opposite Anna Horish Hill to scan the blue, back in that field to launch our long-tailed comet. And now it hovers, tugs, veers, dives askew, lifts itself, goes with the wind, until it rises to loud cheers from us below. Rises, and my hand is like a spindle unspooling, the kite a thin-stemmed flower, climbing and carrying, carrying farther, higher, the longing in the breast and planted feet, and gazing face and heart of the kite flyer, until string breaks and separate, elate, the kite takes off, itself alone, a windfall. And windfall takes us back to the opening poem, to that spark that happens when you're awake for it, that spark of inspiration. But the true human tragic note in this is that at some time, in some way, everyone who is about to die is elated at the thought of absolute separateness, free at last just to fly out into the cosmos as a consciousness unencumbered by history, our person, our personality, or even our loved ones, to just fly elate. And to anticipate that on, in, your, in, the, in the ombre, in the shadow of your own death is an extraordinary thing. But if I may, I'd like to compare that with his um, reading 
his, a kite from Michael and Christopher, it's a, a one five eight, which is written much much earlier. All through that Sunday afternoon, a kite flew above Sunday, a tightened drumhead, an armful of blown chaff. I'd seen it grey and slippy in the making. I'd tapped it when it dried out white and stiff. I'd tied the bows of newspaper along its six-foot tail. But now it was far up like a small black lark, and now it dragged as if the bellied string were a wet rope hauled upon to lift a shoal. My friend says that the human soul is about the weight of a snipe, yet the soul at anchor there, the string that sags and descends, weighs like a furrow assumed into the heavens. Before the kite plunges down into the wood and this line goes useless, take it in your two hands, boys, and feel the strumming, rooted, long-tailed pull of grief. You were born fit for it. Stand in here in front of me and take the strain. Now, the conversation between those two kite poems, and he was being absolutely conscious of kite for Michael and Chris when he wrote the kite for Avian, is the kite is pulling down. So what you send to fly off up there, really, it, you, you don't lose the connection. And the connection is the long umbilical pull of grief and human sorrow. But also at the human chain, stand in here in front of me, boys, and take the strain of it. His two sons will take on where he took on from his father. And so it goes on, the long responsibility the long confrontation with mortality and grief. Mm -hmm. And yet, turn it over, mm -hmm. and years later, maybe 20 years later, knowing he is now inside the, the undertow, the outflow mm -hmm. of his own mortality, mm -hmm. and he writes this beautiful poem for a new grandchild, mm -hmm. as if she's somehow going to fly free of history, mm -hmm. that she will not be pulled down by the long, mm -hmm. sagging tail of grief, will fly up elate. Do you know, what a, a word to find in a poem about a kite, elate. Mm -hmm. So it's a paradox that a number of poets down through the centuries have recognized that the, the prospect of your mortality is, in a sense, a particular kind of freeing up. It frees you up in a strange yeah. way yeah. because there will be no more burdens. The burdens you are carrying now are the last ones you will carry. And after that, mm. I suppose it's a bit like retiring from a post as a professor. Do you know? <laughs> Thank God I never have to look at them again. You know? <laughs> I'm sure none of your teachers feel that way about you. I'm sure they gaze on you with love and devotion every hour of the day. Theo, um, I want to talk to you for a moment about um, the poem album, where he writes, great proofs often come of a sudden, one off, and then the steady dawning. How do you think, and I think you've already begun to speak about it, how do you think illumination comes about in this volume? And what kinds of illumination really strike you here? Show me what page is that on, because I want um, to have it in front of me while yep. I talk to you. Um, it's album five. So oh, yeah, 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 of course it is. I actually think I had the sticker on that. Yep. It's near the beginning of it. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, yeah, here yep. we are. Yeah. I had a sticker in that one, yeah, mm. just before the chariot here at Delphi. There we are now. Mm -hmm. I will put it up there. Can you um, Ahocht. Ahocht. Now here's a curious thing. Anybody who ever tells you that wrote a poem is speaking metaphorically, because the actual truth is we don't write poems, the poems write us. This is not a colourful way of speaking. I mean it absolutely literally. Robert Graves has a poem called The Dance of Words. To make them move, you must start from lightning and not attempt to forecast the rhythm. Rely on chance, or so-called chance, once lightning interpenetrates the dance. Grant them their own traditional steps and postures, but see they dance it out again and again until only lightning is left to puzzle over the choreography plane and the theme plane. So, there's the poem in its moment. There's your best effort to grasp it as it comes in. And then, depending on the level of commitment you've shown to your craft and the amount of time you've invested in it, there's the long slog of chasing the poem down in words. 
so that if you're very lucky, you almost catch what it was and write a tone. That's roughly the process. But you must be awake and ticking like an electric fence and always awake for the poem itself. Graves also says it starts as a little verbal nucleus or it can simply be an insistent rhythm that takes over in your mind. Michael Hartnett says, I have poems to hand, it's words I cannot find. Yeah. So the poems are always out there. All of us, every one of us in this room has walked through the air of poems. The way you walk through charged air after a strike of lightning. All of us have done and will do it over and over again in our life. We walk through poems. They don't always, depending on how our minds are framed, they don't always find their way into words. But if you think of a poem as a disembodied constellation of meaning, at some sense, part of the architectonics of light and air and electricity, the world meaning itself, and instances of that will push themselves into this extraordinary mystery of language. And if you're working at it, and if you're dedicated to it, it will find its way into an artifact in words that somehow becomes a craft to carry it down the stream, or a little net to hold it. It's why people say a poem is never finished, only abandoned. Mm. You carry it as far as you can, and, mm. and then you have to let it go, because that's as much as you can do. The thing to watch for is how much is as much as you can do. And the great ones, like Seamus, are the ones who never cease from craft, which is possibly slightly tangential to what you were no, asking me. No, it's not at all. But listen, to what, here we are, look. No, oh no, that's, um, it took a grandson. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, there it, is. it took a grandson to do it properly, to rush him in the armchair with a snatch raid on his neck, proving him thus vulnerable to delight, coming as great proofs often come of a sudden one-off, then the steady dawning of whatever erat demonstrandum, whatever was to be displayed. Well, the great proof that comes suddenly and then works itself out is the proof of our mortality, it seems to me, to know yourself mortal. I know that with one or two exceptions in the room, everybody here is immortal. I mean, it's a privilege to spend time in the company of the immortal. You know you're never going to die, don't you? You feel it in your bones. You feel it pulsing along your veins. You're never going to die. It's all out there to happen. Well, good luck. That was me too, once. The great truth is, every single person in this room is going to die. <laughs> You're all going to die. <laughs> and I remember, as a, a sort of a freelance pagan Buddhist reading, that that is the one truth you need to know. And just like you, a slightly nervous giggle, a wish to go, ah, but you fuck off. But get tempered by, and you've all felt that the little still voice in the back of your mind saying, oh, God, yeah, unfortunately, that's true. Well, unfortunately, it is true. There's no escaping it. But that's why we love the world. It is why the souls gather on the banks of Lethe, hoping to be reborn. Not as a punishment, as Virgil has it sometimes, but as a great privilege. To be born is a privilege into this extraordinary world. And Seamus' poetry is so tactile and so full of the things of the world because in the simplest possible terms, he loved being in the world, incarnate. The incarnation is the great mystery at the heart of Christian belief. Incarnation, the Buddhists are a bit ambiguous about it. They don't know whether it's a punishment or a joy, but I say, in this instance, the hell with the Buddhists. It is a joy to be alive. And the deal is, you can only be alive because you're going to die. And if you're not going to die, you won't be alive. So, I mean, take the deal as my advice. Live every moment. And if living every moment is, I'm going straight back to bed as soon as he shuts up. Well, enjoy going back to bed. Do you know? Enjoy whatever you do in the one and only body you're ever going to have in this one and only world we're ever going to know. Enjoy it. If there is an afterlife, it won't be you. It will be some version of you that you won't recognize who will not remember this. So enjoy the world. That's what actually what poetry says, what all poems say. No matter how much you're suffering, 
no matter what anguish you're feeling, no matter what rage against injustice you feel, enjoy being in the world. When you are as outraged as I am about Donald Trump, enjoy the fact that there is breath in your lungs to express the outrage, you know, and be glad that you're not him. That <laughs> poor, sad bastard. <laughs> he hasn't a clue. You read what he says, he does not know how to be alive. He's a caricature of what a human being should be. And you are all, if I can tell by looking at you, infinitely superior to him, even if only in your own minds. So enjoy being superior to him. <laughs> but enjoy the next breath you take and the next one because it's one in a finite sequence. Don't waste it. One of the reasons we make paintings and books and music is to augment that breath by breath, one and only life we have. It doubles it, it enriches it. Immerse yourself in this book and be Seamus Heaney while you're reading it. Be that sensibility. Be Ivan Bolan, be Paula Meehan, be Tom McCarthy. Be Bob Dylan, be Leonard. Peace to his soul. Be all those things. Books allow us to cheat the game. We can be more than ourselves while being ourselves. I mean, what's not to like? You're all dying to get to bed with somebody so that you can be that person as well. That's the only reason you really go to bed with somebody, is to be them as well. So you can do it in books with a lot less um, anxiety about what your mammy is going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was going to ask you a question, but actually I think you've, re you've, you've tremendously answered it. <laughs> two questions, actually. One, whether this book is haunted, and two, whether it's consoling. But it's I not think just haunted, it's haunting. It's yeah. haunting. It's consoling in the sense that Seamus already knew he was dying. He knew he was going to die. And he faced it with such style and dignity that, you know, of all the, it's yet another of the many lessons mm. he has given us. And, and I'm not making him out to be some kind of secular saint like the Padre Pio of Balahi, you know? It's not like that. Because he was genuinely humble about his gift. He truly saw it as a gift. When he was given the Nobel, he said, I accept this on behalf of all the poets of Ireland. And Jerry Murphy from Cork sent him an email saying, how much is my share? <laughs> <laughs> but he meant it. And what he said was, um, and when he endowed the Poetry Allowed Prize, and when he helped set up the Ireland Chair of Poetry and so on, he said, when you ha he said a simple thing, but he meant it. When you have a good harvest, you share it with the neighbours. You know, in that second poem I read there where he's throwing the sacks on, you don't do that one-handed, you do that with a neighbor. One, two, up it goes, one, two. When you read back through the books, it's extraordinary how often when work is mentioned, it's almost always collective work. There's none of this whining of second-rate poets, oh, it's very hard sitting here all by myself writing these tough poems. Get over yourself, you know, it's only a pen, it's not a truck that you're lifting. And it, it, for him, work is always communal and shared, and then so are the joys. Yeah. So it's a very poignant book. Yeah. It was when he was still alive. It became more so. To be honest with you, Katrina, when you asked me to come out and do this, I, I, I had to stop for a thing and think there's a severe danger I'm going to disgrace myself by breaking down in tears, just evoking his presence. He was such a good friend to so many, you know? But he shaped it, and he made form to hold it, and he left all the poems, as all the great dead have. They leave us the poems as gifts to be opened and read and lived in, if we choose. Do you know what? Nobody, he has a poem there where he says, he has a thing there where he says he's suspicious of poetry. And he's right to be, because in the universities, I'm walking carefully here now, up to recently, poetry is a kind of a monolith. And people are terrified, they're expected to like it all. There isn't, there's stuff I cannot abide. Browning makes me want to not have eaten breakfast. I just don't resonate with Browning. I don't like John Ashbery. And all the cool young dudes kind of go, yeah, man, you don't get it. I don't get it. I don't want to get it. Ashbery is bloody boring. You know, I'm sorry. The fault is entirely mine. I'm sure he's a genius of the first order. I don't get it. And you know what? 
I'm not going to live forever. I'm not going to get it. I have other fish to fry, other things to read. You don't have to love at all. You have to be smart and respond as best you can to questions you're asked about the set text. I mean, don't be an idiot. But when it comes to taking poetry into your own life, bring in the ones that matter. It doesn't matter whether they're fashionable or unfashionable. Don't be put off if somebody is fashionable. Don't worry, they'll soon be unfashionable. That's what fashion is about. Find your kindred spirits. Find your kindred spirits and read, po not poetry, read poems. Poems, individual poems. Find the handful that speak to you and carry them all your life. I promise you, you've no reason to trust me because you've never seen me before in your lives and like never, but I promise you, nonetheless, you will never, ever regret taking a poem that speaks to you at any moment in your life and committing it to your heart. It will be, it will be the most extraordinary and unexpected and surprising friend to you at the most unexpected moments in your life. There's a poem by the Russian poet Osip Mandelstam that I love. What shall I do with this body that has been given me? So much at one with me, so much my own. For the calm happiness of breathing, for the joy of being alive, tell me, where should I be grateful? I am garden and gardener too, and unalone in this vast dungeon. My breath, my mark, you can already see on the window pane of eternity. A lovely pattern is imprinted there, unknown till now. Let this muddle die down, the sediment flow out, the lovely pattern cannot be crossed out. And every one of us will make that pattern on the window of eternity. Make it a good one. That's all they ask of us. That's all is asked of us. Make it a good one. And it, what shall I do with this body that hasn't? What will you do with the body that has been given with you? Do not waste it. And the banks of Lethe, as Seamus reminds us, there are thousands of souls aching to be reborn back into this one and only miraculous world. My advice is it's a lot easier to get it right the first time. You know? Even when your heart is breaking, sing. You can always sing the blues. You know? <laughs> That's what it's for. Theo, that's fantastic. Mm. Could I invite you at this point to read us one or two poems of your own? You could, but I'd much rather read some poems of Seamus. So we'll compromise. I'll read one more by Seamus, and then how much time have we left? We have How few can I get away with reading? Just about another two, three minutes, perhaps, yeah. Is that what we have now? Yes. At I'm this afraid. point? Yes, yeah. Well, okay, then I will read one of my own. I'll read two, very quickly. Um, you know the way at the start there, right, you're talking about, he says, you know, what are the very first line? Had I not been awake? Yeah. Um, I was walking to Anna McCurry, walking down a step, and somebody quoted a line by Cesare Pavese, death will come and have your eyes. And is it in this? Oh, it isn't in it. So I don't have to read it. I'll read a different one. Excellent. It's not in that book. Um, I want to read a poem from Mr. Leonard Cohen. I'll tell you a little brief story. Leonard had a, brought out an album about eight, nine years ago called Ten New Songs. Anybody know it? One, I have one friend for life. <laughs> Two, good man. <laughs> right, you get a gold star today. <laughs> Leonard Cohen was a Canadian singer, songwriter. He was one of the most gorgeous men who ever lived. He wrote genius songs. If you don't know him, shame on you. <laughs> I'm <a> disgusted with you. <laughs> Rectify this immediately. I will be back here next week at the same time to check <laughs> that you've been listening to him. But Leonard wrote a wonderful song called um, say goodbye to Alexandra leaving. And I'm listening to this and thinking, that's wonderful. Hang on a second. They're into my library. Take down C.P. Cavafy, the great Greek poet born in Alexandria. And there it is. The God abandons Anthony. And say goodbye to Alexandria leaving. And there's whole lines and phrases that he's gone and thieved out of the poem and put in the song. And I thought, you genius. So. I had, because, um, you know, bad poets borrow, good poets steal. It's an old formula, and it's a true one. Anyway, here's Leonard, and he's done this. And in a rush of blood to the head, I got a hold of his email. I can tell you what it is now that you won't be able to bother him. It's baldymonk at AOL.com. <laughs> and I sent him an email saying, I've written a poem. See, I, 
Caroline Duffy was doing an anthology and she asked people to pick a favourite poem and then write a response. And with the hubris which comes naturally to people born in Cork, I decided the finest poem I know is Ithaki by Cavafy, so I'll write an answer to that. And um, so I wrote to Mr. Cohn and said, I've written a poem, I'd like to dedicate it to you as thanks for all of the wonderful poems all down these years, but I won't inflict the poem on you. And I got back an email saying, oh no, please send the poem. I should mention that we shared a birthday. Are you getting the picture here? <laughs> and um, so I sent him the poem and I got back my all time favorite email. It rhymes, it scans. Honored, Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a take the rest of the month off moment. <laughs> so listen, Katrina, thank you so much for asking me to I have to tell you guys, I am seriously impressed. Either you live in great fear or you're absolutely dedicated to learning, but 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning is impressive. I congratulate you. <laughs> and I thank you for your patience and for the fact that only two or three of you felt it necessary to carry on a conversation the whole way through, but <laughs> it was obviously <laughs> urgent and necessary conversation, so <laughs> the urgent and necessary must always take precedence over courtesy and politeness. <laughs> That was, really, that was good, wasn't it? See the <laughs> knife go in there? You know who you are. So, it's, do you know what? This school has transformed. This has become the best school of English in the country. It's just such a joy to be here. So, Ithaca. If you have to leave, go now, because it will really annoy me if you leave in the middle of the poem. So, if you've got to go, go. And go quickly as well, because there are people who want you to be gone. It's better. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's it. The window is closed. Nobody else leaves. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we let them go. It's better yeah. because they're yeah. peppering and they'll yeah. start drifting in ones yeah. and twos. Yeah. Right. Here we go. Would you close the doors, please, so that the, um, the barbarians are kept outside the gates? So for Mr. Le Leonard Cohen, may he have peace on his journey, Ithaca. The premise of the poem is that Odysseus comes home, sorts everything out with Penelope, they live a little life, Penelope dies, Telemachus goes away and has his own life, and I just don't see Odysseus sitting down there counting his sheep headage payments like a farmer for the rest of his life. Sooner or later he's going to head out again, yeah? So, when you set out from Ithaca again, let it be autumn, early, the plain leaves falling as you go, for spring would shake you with its quickening, its whispers of youth. You will have earned the road down to the harbour, duty discharged, your toll of labour paid, the house four square, your son in the full of fatherhood, his mother, your long beloved, gone to the shades. Walk by the doorways, do not look left or right, do not inhale the wood smoke, the shy glow of the young girls, the resin and pine of home. Stand there and hold their gaze, they have been good neighbours. Plank fitted to plank, slow work and sure, the mast straight as your back. Water and wine, oil, salt and bread, take a hand in yours for luck. Cast off the lines without a backward glance and sheet in the sail. There will be harbours, shelter from weather. There will be long, empty passages far from land. There may be love or kindness. Do not count on this, but allow for the possibility. Be ready for storms. When you take leave of Ithaca, round to the south, then strike far down for Circe, Calypso, what you remember, what you must keep in mind. Trust to your course, long since laid down for you. There was never any question of turning back. All those who came the journey with you, those who fell to the flesh of bronze, those who turned away into other fates are long gathered to asphodel and dust. You will go uncompanioned, but go you must. There will be time in the long days and nights, stunned by the sun or driven by the stars, to unwind your spool of life. You will learn again what you always knew. The wind blows everything away. 
When you set out from Ithaca again, you will not need to ask where you are going. Give every day your full reflective attention, the rise and flash of the swell on your beam, the lift into small harbors. And do not forget Ithaca. Keep Ithaca in your mind, all that it was and is and will be without you. Be grateful for where you have been, for those who kept to your side and those who strode out ahead of you or stood back and watched you sail away. Be grateful for kindness in the perfumed dark, but sooner or later you must sail out again. Some morning, some clear night, you will come to the pillars of Hercules. Sail through if you wish, you are free to turn back. Go forward on deck, lay your hand on the mast, Hear the wind in its dipping branch. Now you are free of home and journeying, rocked on the cusp of tides. Ithaca is before you. Ithaca is behind you. Man is born homeless and shaped for the sea. You must do what is best. has taught us how to trust to our course. Just thank you so much. Do you mean this, that in the academic sense? Session. Trust to your course. <laughs> Study the books. You are free. <laughs> to go.